In the late summer of 1097, a crack force of heavily armoured warriors came hurtling down through the mountain passes of Cilicia in sun-scorched southeastern Anatolia to enter the lush coastal plains beyond. To say that the region had a turbulent recent history would be an understatement. First held by the Roman Empire, the sought-after coastal plain had been conquered by the Arabs in the 8th century becoming the front line of its 200-year war against the Byzantines, until it was finally reconquered by the warrior emperor Nicephorus Phocas in the late 10th century. Since then, Cilicia had enjoyed a relative period of peace under the prosperous 40-year rule of Emperor Basil II, followed by another period of imperial collapse, brought on in part by the arrival of a new power in the region, in the form of the Seljuk Turks. Remnants of all of these occupiers could still be seen littering the landscape and in the ethnicities and culture of the people who lived there. Now, in the twilight years of the 11th century, the Seljuk Empire was on the brink too, fairly quickly fragmenting into various successor states after the death of the Sultan Malik Shah in 1092. Most of the people who lived in Cilicia were now Armenians. They lived under the rule of Turkish garrisons. And now there was another faction to add to the mixing bowl. Numbering no more than 200 men and guided by a local Armenian who knew the winding mountain paths well. 200 or so Norman knights arrived at the thriving metropolis of Tarsus. The local Turkish garrison rushed out to face the newcomers and were soon pushed back. Normans were used to fighting in unfamiliar territory and in small numbers. In fact, they'd made a lifestyle out of it, from the Irish Sea to the Eastern Mediterranean. They'd even been active in this very same region over the last half century or so of crumbling Byzantine rule. And now, the leader of this small force was going to attempt to establish himself, as his kinsmen had done all over Europe, as the new feudal lord of the region. Quickly establishing a loose cordon around the town, the Normans made an elaborate show of preparing for the coming conflict loudly proclaiming that they were just the vanguard of a much larger force on the way. Under the overall leadership of the great Bohemund of Taranto, master of southern Italy. For these Normans were different from the groups of former mercenaries that likely still clung on in the region since the days of the rebel general Philaratos Bukamios said to have had a corps of 8,000 Norman mercenaries. This really was the vanguard of an extraordinary expedition. The leader of the force was Tancred, just 20 years old and Bowman's young nephew, yet every bit the spitting image of his uncle and his grandfather, Robert Guiscard. Tancred was destined to be one of the most famous of all Norman adventurers, and by day's end, that the Turkish garrison would give up and yield control of the city. With just 200 men, Tancred had seized control of one of the most important cities in the region, flying his banner for all to see. The geopolitical situation of the East was about to be transformed forever. Normans had already taken England southern Italy and Sicily, and now they were going to take lands in the east. In the late 1090s, the gradual appearance of the armies of the First Crusade at the court of the Byzantine Emperor Alexius Comnenus proved to be a logistical nightmare. Month after month, year after year, as tens of thousands of Western Europeans passed through Constantinople. Alexius had the unenviable task of feeding and lodging the newcomers as they passed through his lands. 
Thankfully, for the most part, the great lords of Western Europe who had taken the cross, men like Raymond of Toulouse, Hugh the Great of France, and Godfrey of Bouillon, have been genuinely motivated by religious conviction, and thus keep their men in check. As they passed through Alexius's court, one by one, they made oaths to the emperor to return any previously held imperial lands back to him as they passed through Asia Minor. In return, he would provide them with a guide with much needed logistical and military assistance along the way, and could provide vital information on the Turkic armies they were about to come up against. When one of the last of the great lords who had taken the cross arrived in Constantinople, however, Alexius had good reason to be wary. The Italo-Norman warlord Bohemund of Taranto was a giant of a man, both in stature and in character. He had spent an entire lifetime making war. Yet, nonetheless, Bohemund proved to be every bit the gentleman when he arrived in the great city in 1097. Alexius Comnenus, one of the greatest Byzantine emperors in history, and a man who had somehow brought his empire back from the brink of total collapse during the first decade of his reign, was convinced. In a personal meeting between the two one-time enemies, Bohemund agreed to make the oath, but only after suggesting that the emperor give him the title Domestic of the East, a powerful rank not held for a number of years since the disastrous loss of most of their eastern lands to the Seljuk Turks, after the defeat at Manzikert in 1071. Always a tacit politician, and knowing the Norman history to further their own goals, Alexius politely declined the offer. All of Bohemund's apparent newfound interest in supporting the empire, worrying omens for the future, were also seen that day. Bohemund wasn't the only Norman in the army. By the time he arrived in Constantinople in 1097, Bohemund had amassed around himself an elite force of some 5,000 like-minded young men, many of them blooded from decades of warfare in the brutal maelstrom of 11th century Italy. Some had even been Byzantine mercenaries at some point in their careers. These Italo-Normans were moulded into a unified force by religious conviction. Most notable amongst Bohemund's inner entourage was his young nephew, Tancred. Just 21 years old at the time, yet every bit as ferocious as his uncle. Tancred was named after the patriarch of their family. His great-grandfather, whose son's exploits in Italy in the first half of the 11th century had led to the establishment of the independent Norman realm there, where Tancred had been born. Tancred, who had been too young to take part in Guiscard or Bohemund's campaigns along the Adriatic in the 1080s, very much possessed the Hauteville penchant for naked ambition. This, combined with the concessions granted by Pope Urban II, he now sought to make a name for himself that would echo down the ages. Bohemund being religiously motivated, Tancred, he and his retinue chose to take the very same route across the Adriatic that Bohemund had once treaded a decade earlier. Tancred publicly take the oath Alexius promptly shipped Bohemund's army across the Bosphorus to Asia Minor to link up with the rest of the crusading army. It was there, on the western border of the Sultanate of Rum, a successor state to the Seljuks that now held sway in much of the interior of Asia Minor, that the first engagement of the First Crusade would take place. Once safely across the Bosphorus, the vast army potentially numbering between 30,000 and 50,000 men, the largest army seen in Western Europe since the fall of Rome, saw the first signs of the alien type of warfare they were about to come up against.
strewn all around them on the plains of northwestern Anatolia lay the remains of the People's Crusade, a movement mostly consisting of organized peasantry that had been decimated by the armies of Kilij Arslan, the Sultan of Rum, just months earlier. Arslan had managed to overcome the People's Crusade, but he decided to leave his capital of Nicaea and campaign against his enemy to the east, the other major Turkic power of Anatolia and another successor state to the Seljuks, the Danish Mens. It was only then that the actual military leaders of the First Crusade arrived in his territory, and they almost immediately laid siege to his capital at Nicaea. After a month-long siege, during which time Kilij Arslan attempted to break through the Crusader blockade to no avail, the garrison of the city surrendered to a Byzantine naval force that had arrived to blockade the port and to negotiate with the governor of the city. Now back in Byzantine hands, the Crusaders push on through the interior of Asia Minor and towards the Holy Land. And the Crusading force restore formerly Byzantine held possessions back to the Empire. Nevertheless, much of the rank and file of the army now trust the Byzantines. waiting for them somewhere out in the hostile and unforgiving plains of central Anatolia was Kilij Arslan, along with thousands of highly trained horse archers. The next battle of the First Crusade would be one of the first instances of a pitched battle between a Turkic army utilising the Eastern style of warfare honed on the steppelands of Central Asia versus a Western European force fighting with an emphasis on heavily armed knights. Due to its sheer size and thus the logistical difficulty of feeding the army, which had to live off the land, the crusading force split into two detachments, the larger part being led by Count Raymond of Toulouse, along with much of the German, Frankish and Flemish detachments. The vanguard, however, a day's march ahead of Raymond's force, was a predominantly Norman affair. Led by Bohemond and supported by William the Conqueror's son, Robert Curtos. On July 1st, near the ancient city of Doraleon, Bohemond's vanguard and Tancred alongside it marched directly into a trap laid by Kilij Arslan, now supported by his one-time enemy, the Danish Mets. The fighting was brutal, and despite heavily outnumbering the attacking horse warriors, losses mounted quickly as the heavily armoured knights and men-at-arms had arrows rained down upon them from the much more mobile Turkic force. The Norman leaders ordered their men to form up into a tight defensive square around their camp, and for hours they defended this position against a ferocious onslaught. Kilij Arslan, assuming this to be the entire crusading army, urged his men ever onwards to press home their advantage and win the day as Tancred and Bohemond urged their men to stand fast against this new style of warfare harassing them from all directions. Contingents of knights began to trickle in from the main crusading force. Most notably, Godfrey of Bouillon, who had ridden hard with his retinue of knights to join the battle. He somehow managed to slip through the Turkish lines to link up with Bohemond and Tancred, yet still, crusader losses continued to mount. For seven hours, they withstood a mauling from the Turks, until finally Raymond's force arrived on the scene with tens of thousands of fresh warriors who flooded out onto the field. Realising the Crusader army too large to deal with, Kilij Arslan retreated. He wouldn't threaten the Crusaders again during the march to the Holy Land. In the aftermath of Doraleon, Alexius achieved some of his initial goals by retrieving various imperial territories adjacent to Nicaea. The Crusaders, meanwhile, continued onwards through Anatolia, towards the major regional city of Antioch. The links Tancred successfully forged with the Armenian lords of Cilicia, most notably Constantine I, the Rubenid Lord of the Mountains, who provided a great deal of logistical support to the Crusaders, and continued to be a firm ally for years to come.
the formerly Byzantine cities were handed back to Alexius. After Antioch finally fell to the Crusaders in June 1098, Bohemond set himself up as the de facto ruler of the city. The decision was made to carry on south to Jerusalem and leave Bohemond the Prince of Antioch. Before annexing much of the adjacent territory into his new state, Bohemond dispatched his erstwhile second-in-command, Tancred, to be his representative at the Siege of Jerusalem. It was Tancred's time to shine. After another fierce siege, the holy city of Jerusalem finally fell to the Crusaders in 1099. Tancred was one of the very first men to enter the city. Interestingly, in a brief glimpse into Tancred's personality, he is said to have given his standard to a group of terrified citizens who had taken refuge atop the Temple of Solomon. An act guaranteed their safety. During battle, fought at Ascalon, Tancred formed a major part of the army that punched through the Fatimid lines, ensuring the survival of the new polity. Upon the carving up of Jerusalem, Tancred, still only in his early 20s at the time, was made the Prince of Galilee, one of the highest ranking positions in the kingdom, and one which came with cities and castles. After close to three years of campaigning, Tancred had finally achieved what he had set out to do. Though he wasn't independent, being subject to the defender of the city and leader of the Crusaders, Godfrey of Bouillon. Oermund, meanwhile, rode north from Antioch in 1100 with just a few hundred knights to aid one of his Armenian allies, Gabriel of Melitene. A former officer of the Byzantine Armenian general Philaratos Procamios, who now held out in a stronghold to the north of Antioch. Bohemond was ambushed by the Danish men's Turks, who promptly took him prisoner. Thus, Tancred was called north by the Norman leadership to assume the regency of Antioch. Out of respect for his uncle, he didn't use the title of prince. Tancred would go on to hold the position of ruler of Antioch, on and off, for the next 12 years. Whilst Bohemond languished in the dungeons of the Danish men's, Tancred immediately set about reoccupying his old conquests in Cilicia to reinforce the young principality, and stocking the walls of Tarsus with loyal Armenians and Normans. He expanded his territory by annexing and conquering land from the multitude of Armenian factions in the region, making common cause with the most legitimate Rubenid Lord of the Mountains, Thoros I, against the others. Likewise, Thoros was able to expand his own realm significantly due to Tancred's help. As well as going north, Tancred moved to the south too, showing particular interest in the port of Latakia. After three years of captivity, during which time he had refused the help of the Emperor Alexius, knowing that this would likely amount to little more than the exchange of one prison cell for another, Bohemond was successfully ransomed back by Tancred. Tancred had proved to be an effective ruler of Antioch in Bohemond's absence, and was instrumental in the defence of the young principality. Almost as soon as Bohemond was released, however, he launched into another full frontal attack, and again he was met with disaster. At the Battle of Haran in May 1104, the army of Edessa was annihilated. Its Count, Baldwin II, captured by the ruler of Mosul, Kikirmish, and held captive for the next four years. In Baldwin's absence, Tancred controlled Edessa, placing his cousin Richard of Salerno in charge. Bohemond, meanwhile, returned to Europe to gather support for another crusade. <laughs> 
Yet again, this left the Regency of Antioch in the capable hands of Tancred. For a short time, placing the leadership of both of the northernmost Crusader states in Norman hands. An astonishing achievement. In 1104, the Edessan army had been destroyed at Haran, prompting the Turkish ruler of Aleppo, Ridwan, to embark on an expansionist policy against the Crusaders. Tancred, however, was a master of strategy, successfully leading Ridwan into a trap before breaking through his force with a customary Norman cavalry charge. The Battle of Arta was such a success for the army of Antioch that they not only restored all of the territories lost at Hrath, but rode all the way into the suburbs of Aleppo, sacking as they went, before exacting tributary status on the city. Tancred didn't take the city. He was weakening Aleppo to make way for an eventual attack. Upon Baldwin's release in 1108, the Count returned to Edessa to reclaim his position. Despite still being surrounded on all sides by hostile Islamic powers. Tancred returned to Antioch, where he continued to rule. Meanwhile, in Europe, Bohemond had succeeded in rallying a vast second crusading expedition. Instead of heading back to the Holy Land, however, he opted to attack Alexius directly, ending in total defeat by the Byzantines. After signing a treaty in 1108, whereby he promised Antioch's overall vassalage to the Empire, Bohemond never returned to Antioch, dying a few years later. Tancred, now at around the same age as Bohemond had been when he first took the cross, continued to expand his realm, becoming the undisputed ruler of Antioch and by extension, by far one of the most powerful crusader lords in the east. In 1110, he brought the imposing castle of Crac de Chevalier under his control and secured himself a powerful ally and the beginnings of a dynasty by marrying Cécile, the daughter of the King of France. By 1111, he formalised his influence over Aleppo, formally making it an Antiochian vassal, apparently enforcing mosques in the city to install crosses over their minarets. Tancred was an astonishingly rigorous and energetic ruler, said to disregard sleep and leisure in preference to wakefulness and work. By 1112, he had brought Antioch to its absolute territorial peak. It was by far the strongest of the Crusader states. Within a matter of weeks, however, in one of the most fortuitous moments in the history of both the Crusades and the Norman conquests, a typhoid epidemic tore through the city, killing Tancred in the prime of his life. Tancred was succeeded as regent by the man deemed most fit for the job, his nephew, Roger of Salerno, son of his erstwhile lieutenant, Richard. Roger ruled as the power behind the throne until Bohemond's young son, Bohemond II, came of age. He did well, winning victories against the neighbouring Muslim states. From then onwards, Antioch entered a long and steady decline, until it was finally stamped out of existence in the 13th century. <laughs>